This conference will now be recorded. Good morning. My name is Joachim and I work at Know How Solution in Malmö, Sweden. And welcome to this webinar. Uh, I have also a co-worker, Henrik, uh, that uh, helped me organize this for, for the Danish people or Danish customers. Uh, and today we have uh, Fernando, uh, who will do this uh, webinar. And Fernando is the CTO of Visher, and he's based on based in in uh, San Francisco. So it's in the middle of the night there. So I hope you are in in good shape, Fernando, and and welcome. So uh, I will just hand over to you, Fernando. Uh, Absolutely. Um... Thank you, Joaquin. Uh, I, I, I will just tell you, uh, everyone, that if you have questions, please, please use the chat uh, function in, in GoToMeeting. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, well, uh, welcome all of you to the uh, to this webinar on, on Visher and how to get started with uh, the formalization of a good requirements process, especially for embedded development. But not only that. Um, Joaquin made a uh, an introduction um, to um, to Visher myself. I'll just give you a little bit of uh, background. Visher is a uh, provider of solutions in the field of requirements, uh, risk, and test management, um, and we are specialized in safety critical environments, uh, in particular automotive, aerospace defense, medical devices um railway and um other regulated environments like energy nuclear um, and so on um as uh, joking mentioned uh, my name is fernando valera i'm visual cto um i have been in the, the field for approximately 20 years i have been deploying uh, this type of processes in in europe that's where i started um, and a decade ago, we um, Visher actually opened an office in in the core and the heart of Silicon Valley in San Francisco, which is where I'm currently located. And uh, even though we have uh, teams in um, actually in in Europe, in France, Spain, uh, um, and of course uh, know how in Scandinavia, uh, we also have teams in in other locations. Uh, but we decided that I would um, may take care of this webinar um, in order to answer any question that you might have, uh, because I've been focusing on this environment for, for the past uh, decade. So um, you know, I'll be more than glad to answer any questions that you post in the chat. So please feel free to, to post any, anything that you might want to know uh, in the chat at any moment. Even though we will leave uh, five minutes of Q&A uh, at the end, but um, I think the, um, the, the the benefit of this webinar is is to make them interactive, and I will um, I will try to address them as they come. Good, and we have 45 minutes, um, and I'll try to cover um, basically how to get started with the with the processes, and then um, just Usually, uh, we don't start a project completely from scratch, but we typically have information in Word, Excel. Um, or sometimes we are migrating the platform from, from doors, or we might even need to exchange information with other organizations using RecIF, for instance. Um, then we will talk a little bit about the specific details of what makes a good requirements management process, like. A versioning, uh, configuration management, um, the, the requirements review and approval, uh, but also the quality of requirements. We will talk a little bit about that. Um, and uh, definitely, definitely uh, traceability, which is the key component in the majority of the standards. And we will basically start um, by talking a little bit about uh, requirements and the importance of requirements. Um, basically, uh, the definition of a function is basically the behavior or the intended behavior of a thing, 
whatever that is. It might be a, an aircraft, it might be a, a, a car, or it might be a part of the subsystem. Um, also, if we think about the system design, and these are uh, basically definitions, standard definitions, um, the system design is, is the process of defining elements of a system like modules, architecture, components, and the interfaces based on the requirements. And finally, the safety assessment process is a methodology to evaluate, uh, well, aircraft functions or functions in general, and the design of the system performing these functions to determine that associated hazards for those functions have been properly addressed. So basically, uh, requirements are the basis for functional safety, which is the core of all, all the standards out there. Um, whether we're talking about ISO 26262, 62304 for medical devices, a DO 178 for um, uh, airborne systems, uh, the um, main purpose is to make sure that we're building systems that are safe to use. Um, and that is impossible without requirements, as we have just seen um, based on the definitions. But also, we have to take uh, into account that requirements are much more than that. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that you've all seen this this diagram or this picture of the uh, the swing. But uh, if you haven't, I'm honored to be the first one presenting them. But it's always good to uh, you know refresh refresh them from time to time. So this is just an example of. A, a weird request from the user. Uh, we are not sure why they're asking that, but hey, the the customer is always right. And you know, um, me being in in the U.S., you can imagine that that is religion here. So uh, somehow the project manager tries to make sense of what um, he or she understood. Uh, but in the way, we forget the small detail of having both ropes in the same branch. Uh, so the design kind of um, is, is not optimal, let's put it that way. Um, so we call the consultant, and of course, there's uh, birds and music in the background way beyond uh, what were our initial expectations. So we got to make it work, and uh, we will make it work. And, and the requirements are the requirements they are taking uh, as they are. Um, and uh, unfortunately, those decisions are not even documented anywhere. And they are somewhere, but um, not in a single source of truth. And uh, when we realize what's going on, the budget of the the whole system is like if we had built a you know a rocket or a roller coaster. But the most important thing is that what the user really needed has nothing to do with what the user said uh, that they needed, um, what we understood uh, that they needed. Um, or what was finally implemented. That's why requirements sometimes are so important because uh, they not only define the safety, but it also they define what will be a good product. So um, this process of building a, a product is usually defined in different phases. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the process and then uh, we will move on to some other more complex aspects. Um, and generally speaking, we can divide the uh, development of any product into different phases. Um, we will probably have a, a higher level set of requirements, uh, usually product requirements, con ops, user requirements, marketing requirements, or a whole set of, of documents. They just define the problem statement what is it needed from the user's perspective, as if the system was a black box. And then uh, we go a level down to 
sort of a system requirement, subsystem requirements, and ultimately we reach the software and hardware components. Um, and in this process, we will see two different dynamics. The first one is the downstream um, set of uh, traceability, or basically the commitment. So when we are defining lower levels, um, what we're basically doing is that we are implementing a solution for a higher level set of requirements, right? Um, but at the same way, uh, we are looking at the higher level requirements. And what we're going to do is that we're going to clarify, we're going to negotiate requirements, and uh, potentially um, we are going to update higher level requirements. So traceability works both ways. It has to be bi-directional. Uh, downstream to make sure that we're implementing the right commitments um, or the right solutions, but upstream to make sure that we are fulfilling the goals, uh, which is essentially making sure that those intended functions of the system are implemented correctly at lower levels. But also we will find at different levels um, what is usually referred to as business objectives, uh, design decisions, depending on the environment, they might be called derived requirements, uh, and they might happen at any level. Right? So uh, we see that uh, the, uh, the process of defining all those requirements um, is an iterative and incremental process, uh, because each step of the way implies several activities. Right? However, uh, each one of those requirements, and probably uh, none of this is, is new for, uh, for any of you, um, but also um, we will have the corresponding test cases at each one of those levels. And um, we might have a, a traditional V life cycle, um, we can also implement a, a, an agile process. We can implement a hybrid process, um, having a V-life cycle at the higher level uh, requirements. And then for the software requirements, we can implement an, an agile process. Either way, we will have test cases along the way. Um, however, uh, this basic requirements management process that can be applied to uh, the majority of the industries um, usually gets a little bit more complex uh, because we don't usually implement a, uh, a single system, but we implement systems of systems or uh, systems that are composed of subsystems. So each one of those systems or subsystems is what we uh, refer to as systems of interest. And system of interest is basically a, a domain within our system that requires a specific team uh, with a specific uh, process. So for instance, the development of a software component can be a system of interest, um, whereas the development of a mechanical component might be another system of interest. So if we actually go to an actual example of, of an autonomous vehicle um, with the different uh, subparts or subcomponents, uh, at some point, uh, a given team might be interested in taking a look at the um, autonomous vehicle from the uh, uh, broader perspective, just to see that uh, all the intended functions have been uh, allocated appropriately, or that, um, let's say, um, that it makes sense from a, from a product perspective. However, another team might be interested in working on the uh, braking subsystem exclusively, and that that is regardless of the rest of the uh, systems or the, the rest of the subsystems. 
Uh, we might also have, let's say, uh, another team working on the EBA. So uh, these systems of interest uh, could be divided into kind of projects or sub-projects. Uh, but in this year, what we're going to do is that we're going to have uh, everything uh, within the same project. Uh, it is one of the possibilities, one of the proposals for today. Um, and we're going to have a very simple approach where we will have a, our folder um, with all the documents pertaining that subsystem, uh, folders, subfolders, whatever structure we need. Um, and within that structure, we will have all the corresponding documentation, for instance, um, requirements documents, uh, safety requirements, uh, test cases, and so on. This is just an example of the folders and subfolders where we would have, let's say, the airbag, uh, the airbag, uh, the airbag folder, and then we might have a document like the requirement specification, and then we will have uh, the requirement specification for each one of the subsystems. Um, so so far, it's pretty pretty obvious what. Uh, what we have in here. However, the key thing in Visher and what we will see later on is that we can implement a graphical system of interest uh, through what we call the data models. So data models in Visher are um, independent diagrams that uh, represent a specific portion of the project. Uh, we can give different access rights to different users so that whenever they open Visher, they only see the system of interest they belong to. So they don't have to see everything, they just see a portion of the reality. Um, and this portion of reality can be also navigated graphically. So for instance, in here we might have uh, the system requirement because they are relevant for our airbag because we need to be able to perform upstream traceability um, as well as having the airbag uh, requirement specification in here. Uh, each one of these boxes represents a document in Visher. Uh, so for instance if I deleted the uh, the box I would be deleting the actual specification or if I change the specification this box we would actually change. And the relationships or the arrows between them indicate the possible traceability between them. The interesting thing is that once I define these diagrams, users will not be able to do anything that is not defined in, in this diagram. So uh, what I'm representing in here is the actual uh, process defined for this specific system or subsystem. If uh, we were working on the uh, software component, um, we might be working on a V life cycle, or we might be having our epics, user stories, tasks, or whatever um, aspects we would like to have. And if we were working on a uh, mechanical component, uh, we would also have a different process. So the combination of all these diagrams is what's going to make the entire system. Um, however, uh, we follow the strategy of uh, uh, divide and conquer, uh, which is going to make a really complex process and system into more manageable pieces uh, focused on the different uh, departments. And uh, what we're going to do is that we're going to take a look at uh, the simple inside Visher. Um, however, whenever we start a project in, in Visher, um, obviously we will not be able to determine all of your uh, systems of interest. However, we do have um, existing templates for the different domains like uh, uh, 61508, Aerospace, uh, for software and hardware, um, automotive template for um, ISO 26262, and we're uh, working on the template for SOTIF, um, for um, autonomous vehicles, um, railroad, medical devices, agile, 
So whenever you start a, a project, you don't have to start from scratch. We already provide the uh, infrastructure for a project in that environment, including a typical uh, systems of interest, uh, typical attributes, uh, typical approval workflows, access rights, um, roles, and so on. So what we're gonna do right now is that I'm going to transition to, to Visher and we're going to take a look at how that works. Before we move forward, uh, do we do we have any questions? Would anybody like to uh, post a question in the chat? Just feel free. Um, good. Let's, let's actually. So, so far, I, I don't see any questions, Fernando. So I think you. Medic I can proceed. Your message. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was one uh, question here. Uh, can uh, we should generate the graphics from the data model? Uh, no, the graphics cannot be generated automatically because they are kind of the core and everything else is actually generated from the uh, from the graphics. Um, and only you can define um, those diagrams, let, let's say. But we will see uh, those diagrams in, in action inside Visher. So Visher is composed of two main components. One of them is the desktop uh, version, and the other one is uh, what we call the Visher authoring, which is the web-based uh, component. Um, the web-based component, it's more of a, uh, like all web components, uh, very flashy, uh, very easy to use. Uh, you can create requirements, edit requirements, you know, establish traceability, uh, review, uh, enter comments, electronically sign specifications. Um, and the desktop version is uh, more oriented towards um, being able to perform um, very deep analysis of the requirements. So, um, you will be able to see, like in desktop applications, uh, more information condensed in uh, a smaller area by, by definition. So uh, users will be able to switch from one to the other um, and work with any one of them. They are both part of the same suite and they share the same database. Very good. So what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to log into a project that I created out of the uh, generic template for systems engineering. And it is not based on any industry standard, but it's just a, a kind of uh, a combination of all the industry's best practices. And what we see here is just Visher. And you can see that this is uh, no different than what you are already doing. So this is pretty much like a Windows Explorer where we have all the folders, subfolders, um, all our, of our requirement um, specifications, our test specifications, tech, test executions, defects, and so on and so on. So uh, pretty, pretty straightforward. However, at the left-hand side here, and just, um, to give you a, a, a quick overview of the interface, um, here we have uh, the dashboards, and dashboards can be generated uh, at the project level, uh, or they can be generated uh, from within individual specifications, and they are completely customizable. So this is just a, um, a set of dashboards that I like implementing in my project, but obviously you can have uh, your own, right? And um, dashboards basically give us information, uh, summarized information on things like uh, traceability, uh, or how is our project doing in terms of um, tracing downstream? Uh, we can see 14% of the requirements are traced downstream. That's pretty poor, uh, but being a sample project, well, it is what it is. In terms of upstream traceability as well, pretty poor, but 
halfway through, we can have information on attributes. Uh, we can have information on the stability of the project, like for instance, suspect links is a capability that indicates that a, a requirement is affected by a change. So this is a very good indication on uh, whether our, our project is, let's say, stable in regards to a baseline or uh, everything might be trade, but everything is changing. So um, we, we know that we have a problem very quickly. Um, we can check the requirement status, but also we have other type of uh, metrics like the testing, uh, what's the requirements coverage, um, what's the status of the executions, how many requirements are passed, failed, uh, what's the defect activity, is it going up, is it going down. Um, same thing with risk management. Uh, this is a, a, an FMEA process, but we also support ASIL process, so uh, a more of a um, automotive safety integrity level. Um, but in any case, uh, things that we want to know is how many um, hazards are beyond acceptability and what's the status of the mitigations. And another dashboard that I really like is the quality analysis. So Visual can read your requirements and indicate whether they are well written or whether there's room for improvement. So for instance, in this case, um, it's pretty shameful that our quality is just 1.7 out of 5, but this indicates um, that, well, this there are a lot of requirements that are um, kind of um, all over the place, or um, they are halfway written, or things like that. The metrics are based on, again, best practices of, of the market, um, for instance, that we're not using ambiguous terms, that we're using a shall or a should statement. We'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, and I see several several questions. Um, so can a requirement on a lower level refine several higher level requirements? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, it is it is actually a goal to implement one solution that solves many different needs um, and we should actually try to do that as much as possible and Visher certainly supports that. Um, uh, there's another question we'd like to hear about developing unit tests for embedded systems, especially as I have um, to develop a system that communicates via NFC with an em embedded device. How does one unit test one unit test a system that depends on an external system? I don't know if we will have time to cover this question. Um, I will defer that one to the Q and A at the end. Um, and there's another question between two requirement levels there is a design that illustrates how a higher level function is resolved by several sub-level functions. Are those design documents handled by the tool? And that is a very, very, very good question. Um, so yes and no. <laughs> so Visher can absolutely support uh, those design documents. Um, and uh, you can actually trace the requirements to those designs. Uh, it is um, recommended to have them in Visher because then you have a single source of truth. Um, uh, some customers decide to have them separate from the requirements documents. That's also okay. Uh, and then in Visher, you only have the absolutely necessary documents to represent the traceability. Um, it's, uh, it's completely up to you how you would like to to represent those. Um, I like representing them as well in in the doc. Sorry, in the uh, in the process. Um, so we were uh, talking about the the dashboards, um, and here at the left hand side we have uh, the the different 
parts of the tool. Um, and the second one is basically the uh, the views. And the views allow us to configure a specific um, specification or a specific portion of the tool um, and share it with other users. So for instance, if we wanted to share, let's say the impact analysis um, of the project to other users, we could create this view and then just send it to the rest of the users in the project. So for instance, um, in here, what we're seeing is a set of product requirements. And for each product requirement, uh, we see this plus icon that displays the traceability to system requirements. And for each system requirements, we can expand the traceability to uh, you know, mechanical software requirements. From software requirements, if we expand, we can see the traceability to uh, source code, uh, to test cases, the traceability to the execution of those test cases, uh, the results um, of those test cases. And as you can see, this view is extremely powerful because it shows the traceability end-to-end, -end, and we wanted to make it readily available to all the users in the project. So we just create the, uh, the view, share it uh, with the rest of the users. In here we have, um, as we saw earlier, the different documents. Um, we can either create the documents directly from here, or we can just import it from any other source. Let's say uh, doors through Rekayev, um, or Excel, or even Word. What I'm gonna do is that I'm going to open a sample document and let's actually um, take a look at how to import this type of document. So this is just one type of document that we might have um, where we have the, the table of contents, uh, documentation aspects like the introduction, the scope, and eventually we will have requirements in multiple different formats. They can be uh, like this, where we have a code, they might be on a table, they might have bullets. Uh, so what we're gonna do is that we're gonna use the plugin, the Visual plugin for Word or the Visual plugin for Excel. And this plugin is going to allow us to import the uh, documentation aspects, but also we will be able to um, import the requirements based on the text, if they're on a table, uh, based on the table, uh, if they have a specific style based on the style. The whole point of it is being able to parse the entire document. Um, and what we've seen here is all the uh, different chapters and all the requirements that have been detected. We can make sure that everything has been detected correctly before importing. And then we can just compare the items uh, with the actual database. So what I'm doing right now is that I'm connecting to the project that we're working on. Um, and what we can see is that all the elements are new. So yes, it makes sense. I'm uh, actually synchronizing items here. And um, in a couple of seconds, all those objects will be imported in, in Visher. There is a question about the web-based version in the seminar. I will uh, spend a couple of uh, seconds, uh, well, a couple of minutes, sorry, <laughs> showing that web-based uh, component. Um, so yes, I will. I will cover that in a second. Very good. So let's actually go back to um, Visher. Let's review uh, or refresh, 
in here we have the PRD for visual import. What I'm going to do is I'm going to locate it somewhere in here, um, close to the product requirements. And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to double click to actually open this document. And here it is. We have the entire document, um, not only the documentation items, but also uh, we can see that Visher differentiated uh, between an actual requirement and the heading. Uh, and just very quickly here, we can just uh, um, manage requirements individually. Uh, we can, um, for instance, here we can see that this element has been edited individually. We can check it out. We can keep track of all the changes. Um, so for instance, if we change something like 20 years, uh, we will be able to go to the properties and find out exactly um, what was it that was that was changed. Here we have a complete history. Uh, we can do a diff to find out exactly uh, what was it that was changed in, in this uh, requirement, who changed it, why, and so on. So there is a full management of this uh, document inside Fisher. And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to switch at this point to the web interface. And I'll show pretty much the same type of information that we uh, see here, but in the web-based version. So let's uh, log in to the exact same database and the same project. And let's see. If uh, I have the corresponding credentials here. Close word in the meantime. And it looks like uh, my machine is, uh, is still thinking about whether it's a close visual, it's a close uh, word or not. Okay, good. So uh, this is essentially the, um, uh, the web client. And uh, what you can see is that my machine is uh, is actually still thinking about uh, <laughs> whether to respond or or not. Uh, let's just okay. Good. So this is uh, this is the web interface. Um, what we uh, what we have in here is the complete list of specifications, the same specifications that we have inside Visher. Um, you can see that, uh, for instance, the PRD for the Visher import uh, was um, imported correctly and is being displayed in here as well. So, for instance, in here we have uh, the uh, the exact same uh, the same set of elements that we have in uh, in Visher. Um, and let's see. Mm -hmm. All right. Very good. So what we can see is that um, the uh, the same specification uh, that we had in Word uh, was imported in the desktop version, but has also been imported exactly as it appeared in the Word document, but in the uh, web interface. 
uh, just by selecting an element, we will be able to modify it, change it, uh, add comments associated to the requirements. Um, is it um, really what for inches? And comments will be made co completely available uh, within the database to all the users in the system, as we can see in here. Um, users will be able to reply, answer, and so on. And the last portion that I wanted to cover today um, are the data models. And, um, and the data models are the representation of those systems of interest that we were talking about earlier. So what you can see here are the different um, portions of the project. Um, so for instance, let's uh, open the system process. These diagrams are absolutely customizable. Um, the uh, different templates come populated with, uh, with initial diagrams so that you can use. Um, in here we have, for instance, the product requirements document. Um, and we can see how it flows down to system requirements, uh, component requirements, and then the mechanical, electrical, and software. But also uh, what we can see here um, is the traceability to source code. So actually um, clicking on any of, of them uh, will take us to the um, actual uh, specification. And at the right hand side, we can see all the test specifications associated to, um, to those requirement specifications. So for instance, uh, just simply clicking on product requirements will take the user to the corresponding um, uh, document. Um, good. It's um, already 10 of 45 uh, almost. I mentioned that I would leave like a couple of minutes for Q&A. Uh, so I wanted to check if there are questions uh, in the past, in the last couple of minutes. There is Good. no question okay. yet. No, no question yet. So maybe someone is writing right now. Okay, good. So um, then I'll just uh, complete, um, uh, you know, part of the of yeah. the uh, of the demo. Um, so basically, uh, for the for the last uh, for the last minute, um, essentially the uh, requirements the requirements process is uh, defined in part by that. Uh, traceability that we've seen the data models. So defining good data models will be fundamental for the correct uh, um, for the correct uh, deployment of the process. So the tool can really help not only define those but enforce those and make sure that everybody is doing what they're meant to be doing. Um, and then uh, it is just a matter of of completing the specifications, establishing the the traceability, um, and um, and making sure that the coverage is there. Um, I wanted to. Fernando, do, do you see any questions in in your chat now? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Um, there is a question that says, I can see revision number column. Can you say, or can you talk a little bit about, about that? Is it possible to have revision one of a subsystem included in a product day and then revise the subsystem to revision two to be used in product B without a, affecting product A? So that is essentially the definition of, of um, what we call the reusable components. Uh, so the tool does support uh, variants. We can create, let's say, a subsystem, and that subsystem uh, is used in product A and product B. And uh, we can have the same revision in both products, but also uh, we can decide that those 
uh, subsystems evolve uh, differently in different products, uh, but then they can also merge back into the same uh, revision three, for instance. So that is possible. Unfortunately, we will not be able to cover that uh, today. Oh, there is another question. Has requirements approved, uh, improvement handled? One person created a requirement and sent this to the system architect for approval. So basically, Visher uh, supports the concept of approval workflows. Um, we can define the, um, and I will just uh, very quickly open the, uh, the, the same project, um, project organization, attribute workflows, and in pretty much like the rest of the configuration of the project, uh, we provide a starting point, but then you can figure it to fit your own needs. So for instance, in here, we have just a sample uh, process that goes from new to review to approved. Uh, and then we define for each transition, who can, um, which roles can perform that uh, transition. So. Uh, we can make sure that this requirement is reviewed by a set of users, uh, approved by some other users. Um, everybody can enter comments or whoever we decide that need to comment on the requirements um, can also be done. Um, so, so that's essentially how uh, requirements can, can be handled and, and approved. Uh, do we have any other questions? Okay, we've extended a little bit over time, uh, but I would yeah. like to, um, well, I would like to thank uh, all of you. Uh, I know that we've covered a lot of ground in just 45 minutes. Um, it's impossible to cover everything. There's so much more, uh, but I hope it was interesting, that it was useful. Um, and there are more questions. What I'll, I'll do is that I'll stay here um, and I will answer as many questions as you have. I don't have a limit. Um, so I will keep answering questions. Um, anyhow, for those of you who need to leave, uh, thank you so much. You can contact us at, through know-how or directly at info at visualsolutions.com. Uh, we can set up a, a, a demo session uh, just to cover the whole uh, application or, or specific questions uh, that we were not able to address today. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go back to the question. Can I briefly talk a, a little bit about product variants and reuse of requirements? So uh, Visher supports the concept of reusability in which a project can promote a set of requirements, test cases, risks, and other artifacts, and their traceability to reusable components. Um, so whenever we promote a component, this component is published into the catalog or the library of, uh, of components. So any other project in the database or in the organization can browse the catalog and bring those components into their own project. So uh, we can have six projects or six products reusing the same component. And the component can be a system, can be a subsystem, uh, it can be just a set of software requirements. Uh, you decide. Uh, what that component includes. Then the interesting thing about the reusability is that um, whenever we modify the original requirements, we basically create a new revision of the uh, reusable component. And then that revision is published to the rest of the 
products that are reusing the component. So uh, the products receive a notification, like, hey, you're using an obsolete set of requirements. Would you like to upgrade? And then you decide whether you want to stick to your version of requirements or whether you want to upgrade to the latest version. So in a, uh, in a nutshell, that's uh, basically how product variants and reusability of requirements work in Visher. Um, it can be a little bit more complex than that uh, by using what we call global parameters, which are the variances of the components. Um, but we can set up a, a follow-up session to expand in this area. Thank you, Fernando. Um, I think also we should mention if if people want to learn more how to to write good requirements, we we arrange or you arrange a session uh, on the June twenty third, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, um, there is a um, it, actually it's a uh, it's an open course. It's a free course. We usually charge for for that one, but we are. Uh, opening it up to the to the public, um, it's I can't remember two or three hours something like that where we we just go through the standard best practices in requirements management, uh, requirements capture and elicitation, documentation, uh, validation, and so on and so on. So we will send a link to that if people want to register for, for that uh, free training as well. So I, I got some more message on the chat that say thank you very much, Fernando. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. I think it's time yeah. to, to round, round up and, and uh, you to get some some sleep tonight as well. <laughs> That's uh, no, 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 no. I I don't sleep. I just hibernate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, that's good. Uh, well, thank you all. It was a pleasure. It was a real pleasure. And I uh, have a great uh, rest of the day, and I'll have a, a, a great rest of the night. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Fernando. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye.